Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Let's begin. For those of you who are visiting with us at All Saints this morning, we extend you a very, very warm welcome. We would be uh, actually favored if you would pick up a red welcome bag that looks like this. They are at the tables on the back, in the back of the room. Uh, they contain uh, information, current information about upcoming uh, workshops and conferences, programs, ministries at All Saints Church. We would love it if you would uh, fill out the information there, uh, in there, an uh, the information card, and get it back to us. We would like to invite you to return again and again. Over in this corner, we have several of our speakers' books uh, for sale. Um, we have, uh, we've had, I think, 15 or 16 or 17 small groups going on during Lent around Richard's books uh, so far. And so we have a lot of people here at All Saints Church who know a lot about these books. Um, one of our men's groups has been taking a look at From Wild Man to Wise Man, Reflections on Male Spirituality. It's for sale there. Also, Richard Rohr and Friends, Contemplation in Action. Also, the, the um, focus of Richard's presentation this morning, uh, Spirituality in the Twelve Steps, Breathing Underwater. His presentation tonight, The Naked Now, Learning to See is the Mystic Sea, and also uh, his presentation tomorrow night, uh, the chosen book for our Lent event focus this year, Falling Upward, a Spirituality for Two Halves of Life. Um, these books will be, uh, again and more, uh, will be for sale this afternoon beginning at 5 p.m. And also this afternoon at 3.30, there's a Nets for Life Justice Action in the Forum right here in this room, and at 5 p.m., a contemplative worship service in the Learning Center on the top floor of this room, and then Richard will be in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. Our speaker is a Franciscan priest of the New Mexico province. He founded the New Jerusalem community in Cincinnati, Ohio, in 1971, and the Center for Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque, New Mexico, in 1986. He presently serves the Center for Action and Contemplation as founding director. Born in Kansas in 43, he entered the Franciscans in 61, ordained to the priesthood in 70, and received his master's degree in theology from the University of Dayton that same year. Richard lives in a hermitage in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we all want to go and live with him. <laughs> Internationally recognized speaker, Richard has traveled to Europe, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, teaching on such themes as male spirituality, adult Christianity, politics and spirituality, non-dual thinking. He's partnered with the great spiritual teachers of our time. He's best known for his recorded teachings and through the CAC's quarterly publication, Radical Grace. I could go on and on. But what I want to say is that I gravitate to thinkers who make me free. Richard Rohr, in his ministry, has make, been making me free for 30 years. And it is with deep gratitude and a, a lot of emotion that I ask you now to warmly join me in welcoming Richard Rohr. Thank you, Father. That was beautiful, beautiful. Well, we just have a very few minutes. I hope I can make it somewhat worth your while. They asked this, um, this theme, Breathing Underwater, be my topic for this short session. So um, why don't I uh, begin with the poem <clears throat> that entitled the book. I, I first used this poem, I think it was, I was my last year in Cincinnati in 1986 or 85, and they asked me to talk on what I believed were the connections between the gospel and the 12 steps of Bill Wilson. 
And I had recently read this poem by an English nun, Sister Carol Beleck, and it was all there, as so often is the case with good poetry. So in that first set of what were CDs at that time, I mean uh, cassettes at that time, um, I used it and it just continued to speak to people. So I made a second then CD set, How Do You Breathe Underwater? And uh, that continued to be responded to. So a year ago they said, put it in writing. So this is the book in writing. But here's the poem. I built my house by the sea, not on the sands, mind you, not on the shifting sand, but I built it of rock, a strong house by a strong sea. And we got well acquainted, the sea and I, good neighbors, not that we spoke that much. We met in silences, respectful, keeping our distance silences, but looking our thoughts across the fence of sand. Always the fence of sand was our barrier. Always the sand between us. And then one day, and I still don't know how it happened, the sea came without warning, without welcome even, not sudden and swift, but a shifting across the sand like wine, less like the flow of water than the flow of blood. Slow but coming, slow but flowing like an open wound. And I thought of flight, and I thought of drowning, and I thought of death. And while I thought, the sea crept higher till it reached my door. And then I knew there was neither flight, nor death, nor drowning. That when the sea comes calling, you stop being neighbors well-acquainted, friendly, at a distance neighbors, and you give your house for a coral castle, and you learn to breathe underwater. So for me, I became an image of what the uh, addicted person has to do. But the more I worked with it, the more I, I recognized that addiction is, is not something unique to people with substance abuse issues, as we call them today. My contemplative work has helped me see that really, what I think religion at the more mature levels is saying is we're all addicts. Now maybe that isn't the word you, you would have used. They use the word sin. They're approximately talking about the same thing. I am convinced. And a lot of people don't like the word sin today, but addict makes a lot of sense to us. But what... Mature religion is saying is that the universal addiction we have, every one of us in this room, whether I know you or not, well, I unfortunately don't know most of you, but we're all addicted to our way of thinking. That's the universal addiction. And that's why religion at the higher levels said you've got to find a way to detach from that or you won't get very far. That was called meditation or contemplation. Changing the, the software up here. So you didn't process things, as I said at the Mass, uh, with the usual uh, self as the reference point. Until you can displace this single grain of wheat and its preferences and its hurts and its agenda and its needs, you will remain addicted to your own way of thinking. Everything that gets in is through your filters. It becomes sort of obvious once you say it. it you don't even have to prove it to people. And your filters are your own fears, your own cultural agenda, your own biases, your own anger, your own uh, limitedness, your own lack of education in a certain area, which blinds us all. And who of us is not blind in certain areas? And uh, so I was honored you talked about uh, freedom, because I do believe that is the work of authentic religion. And it's yet, yet it's been a word that most of religion is very afraid of. <laughs> very afraid of freedom. That, and with good reason, let me tell you why, if you're at the Mass, what I was saying up above was that we've largely dealt with the false self. Well, you'd, you'd do well to be afraid of the freedom of the false self because it's going to do all kinds of stupid things. So when you don't get to basic transformation in religion of changing the seer, what we're calling these days the change that changes everything, 
when you don't get to the true self, you have to be afraid of freedom. <laughs> Once you get people to their true self, you don't have to be afraid of freedom. <laughs> That's why Augustine can say, love God and do what you want. I mean, Catholic bishops are scared to death to quote the great St. Augustine. <laughs> But he did say it, love God and do what you want. <laughs> Paul says the same thing in approximately three different places, almost identical, same thing, uh, Galatians and Romans. But we just weren't trained to, to uh, handle that kind of freedom, to know that we could have that kind of freedom because we ourselves were trained to mistrust ourselves. And again, I'm going to repeat, you, you almost have to. Uh, if you're still living out of the false self, which is to live out of an addictive personality that sees everything through a set of blinders of what I want, what I need, what hurts me, what I prefer. Uh, they say other teachers than I have certainly said better than I. You know, every preference, every stated preference, every emotional expectation is a resentment waiting to happen, right? So <laughs> what a... What a, uh, what a spiritual teacher do says, well, just get rid of all your preferences. You know, that I have to be this to have this to be happy, or I have to be this way to, be, you know, get through the day. You really don't. But once you set that up, you're setting yourself up for being unhappy most of your life because it's not always going to go that way. And, and so the, the way of freedom is, is to move beyond that. Whereas I said, you know, it's not all about me. So anyway, back to the twelve-step stuff. I, in some ways, although I, I'm sure I'm addicted to the same things many of us are addicted to, uh, uh, what we're used to in our way of thinking, I, I, I never belong to a formal twelve-step program. So probably I have no right to write a book like this. But my, when I first moved to Albuquerque in 1986. Uh, I lived in a little house downtown, and my back door opened uh, where another back door opened where uh, the alcoholics met almost every night of the week. And uh, they would be hanging out smoking, as you know, before, <laughs> before and after the meetings right behind my door. So I couldn't help but meet them all over the years, and they were just nice people. I liked them because they were honest. And... Uh, so uh, several years into it, they knew they were breaking the rules. They have what they call open meetings and closed meetings. And to come to a closed meeting, you're supposed to be a bona fide alcoholic or addict. You're supposed to be able to stand up and say, hi, I'm Richard, I'm a drunk, or something like that. You know? They said, well, we know, Richard, you're not formally, but we want you to come in and see what's happening here. So I started attending these meetings, uh, and as a priest who was used to sanctuaries and, and churches, I would come out from these meetings and say, whatever is happening here <laughs> feels a lot more like church should feel than what's happening in the sanctuary on Sunday morning. And that's not an exaggeration. It was just obvious to me. There was much more humility and there was much more honesty. And when you have humility and honesty, you can build. When you have either of those lacking, you can't build on anything. It's building on sand, as the poet says. So um, it, it was just a conviction of mine that this guy, Bill Wilson, you know, in Akron, Ohio, in the 1930s, I would say it without any, I think was a man inspired by God. And, and he didn't come at it like we did by studying philosophy and theology and eventually sometimes getting down into real life. But he started, as my father, St. Francis, did, at the bottom where the pain is at, and where Jesus, in fact, was, uh, and, and, and tried to make sense out of life right at that point. Uh, he, he went where the pain was, which is where Jesus went. That's what Jesus' healings mean. And he's always moving to wherever the pain is, instead of running away from it or denying it or pretending it isn't true. So um, I made a statement somewhere that I was quoted on an awful lot in subsequent years. I said, I really believe the 12 steps, so pragmatic, so American, so practical, so down to earth, so real, so honest, that they're going to go down in the history of world spirituality as the American contribution. There's something so American about it. And what I mean by that 
is it doesn't get lost in metaphysics and doctrine and dogma and transubstantiation and it just, it get, how can we transubstantiate people, you know? <laughs> Instead of, uh, nothing wrong with doing it to the bread, but, but as, <laughs> as Augustine also said, we do it to the bread and then we feed it to the people so the body of Christ knows it's the body of Christ. So you are what you eat. But we put all of the emphasis on we can do it to the bread, you know. And, and we didn't emphasize, well, are we doing it to the people? Which is the whole point. Uh, the sacraments are for the people, we were told. You're not just for the celebration of the sacraments as an end in themselves. So the, um, the theology, the practice of 12 steps became very sacramental for me because I saw the transformation of peoples that took place. Not in all cases, we can't be naive, but with an amazing success rate that uh, has made so many other groups around the world imitate uh, what Bill Wilson said. Among the many uh, good things he said in the blue book, the big book, whichever one you might have read, uh, he says that we can't be satisfied, and this is where people in religion started taking him seriously, he said, we can't be satisfied with merely overcoming the substance addiction uh, until you uh, achieve what he first called emotional sobriety. Right? Uh, you're not really re in recovery until your emotional life stops going up and down. That's what contemplation is teaching, you know? How to take charge of this self-referential world which is up and down and in and out all the time. Uh, and then he finally said that until you have had a vital spiritual experience. Now, he only said this in uh, the last, later, I believe, editions of the book. He doesn't believe it, the recovery went to any depth or, or affected any long-term transformation. Vital spiritual experience. And he describes that at some length that uh, uh, this small world has to be shaken up and somehow you become aware I am a part of something much bigger <laughs> and all I am is a part. And I'm being led, I'm being guided. And he was wise enough to not get in any uh, food fight with organized religion by naming God. You know, It doesn't really appear that God is too fussy about his name or her name. It really <laughs> All the evidence is that's our problem. It's not God's problem, you know. <laughs> All you got to do is get the relationship right, that you're, in, you're in, in, in relationship to grace, to freedom, to life. But not the name. And the name has caused too much violence, too much mistrust. So Bill Wilson was a genius. He says, okay, we're just going to call it the higher power. You name it what you want. Huh? But there's a power bigger than you. <laughs> and until you learn how to plug into that, and he said with great genius, very similar to the Christian mystics, until an experience leads you to the edge of your own resources, that day where you say, you know, damn it, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I, I can't get over this anger or this whatever it might be or this grief. You will not plug into the big source. You won't. And that became step one, which you're, I hope, familiar with, you know. And you've got to start with the experience of powerlessness. Now that, here, that's very un-American in a way. <laughs> uh, it's about as counterintuitive for the American psyche as you can get. Because we're into climbing, achieving, succeeding power. Uh, and to say, you know, you can't even start this thing till something in your life leads you to experience your utter powerlessness. I cannot get through this alone. And if you're on schedule, I mean, I don't have to program it for you. <laughs> it will normally happen somewhere between 30 and 55. Or, you know, <laughs> uh, if you're listening at all, it's happening. If you don't experience that powerlessness, one death or one tragedy or something, you just, I can't fix it, I can't change it, I can't explain it, I can't understand it, damn it. That's when you learn to plug into the higher power or the, the bigger source. But back a few more words about emotional sobriety. 
uh, when you just stop drinking, but you don't really go deeper with it and, and take some creative control over the swings of your emotions, uh, it's what's called by some, I, may, I don't think they mean it unkindly, the dry drunk. Now, you've probably all met a dry drunk in your life. What it, what it means is someone who formally is off drugs, is off narcotics, is off drink, but they're still, to put it very straightforwardly, they're miserable to live with. Right? <laughs> they're, and what characterizes it, and this got me into the non-dual thing too, is all or nothing thinking. You might be one yourself. Much of the human race is. They're not pleasant to live with. Uh, if it isn't perfect, it's terrible. If it absolutely isn't right, it's heresy, at least if you're a Catholic, you know. <laughs> Just there's no middle ground. There's no, where everything is happening, where everything really is. So that's why it doesn't deal with real life, you know. It's all this black and white thinking. And, and they, they tend to call it all or nothing thinking. Brothers and sisters, if any of you are afflicted with this addiction, you want to be healed of this. I'm telling you, you're never going to be a happy person. I'm telling you, with all the authority I can tell you with, you're going to be a miserable old man. Right? <laughs> you're going to be a bitchy old woman. You are. If, if, you, don't, if, you're, if you don't get beyond all or nothing thinking. And if you can't deal with subtle consciousness, with the gray matter, which is almost everything. Now that's what the Eastern religions, and now we're discovering, we just we call it unitive consciousness, but they described it much more uh, uh, correctly or, or precisely in a way. This is what we'll talk about tonight. They called it non-dual thinking, just to, just to describe it. That you stop differentiating everything from something else. <laughs> the world of comparing and competing. And you do it in your mind. And not only do you do it immediately, and it, I'm going to impress you now, I actually checked this out with Dr. Oz. Yes. <laughs> he listens to my stuff. And uh, when I was in New York a few years ago, he had me stay at his house. So I, because I didn't have a scientific education, you know, I had our medical education. I had to check out the things I say. Is this true now? What I'm saying, he says. And on this one, he said it's absolutely true. The mind is a binary system. The word "tall" when you first hear it as a little two-year-old only makes sense in contradistinction to the word "short." And most people never go beyond that. For the sake of ordinary daily conversation, tall and short is enough. Even though most of us in this room don't really fit one or the other, you know. But we don't want, we don't want to be bothered with subtle consciousness. You see, what we would call in, in Christianity the gift of discernment, where you, you go to a little deeper level and, and say what's really happening here. For ordinary conversation, the ordinary guy on the street is content with his dualistic mind or the all-or-nothing thinking of the alcoholic. And again, you see where, what religion intuited at the more mature levels is now in our century, uh, a great part of the last century too, I mean, being validated by science and medicine and biology. And wouldn't that make sense? I mean, truth is one. If it's true, it's true. You know, that's what it means to be true. And it's true all the time everywhere. Or it's not true. So if it's true, then uh, philosophy should be seeing it. Theology should be seeing it. All from their different angle, and from their different vocabulary. And now, thank God, surprise of surprises, science is seeing it, who we used to think was our enemy, you know. And not at all. Quite the contrary right now. It's very, very exciting. So... Uh, here's where I, I think learning to breathe underwater can be helpful to all of us. To uh, really recognize that you and I are addicted to our, to our binary jumping back and forth, all or nothing. You have to recognize how quickly you do it. By the time you're in your 20s, it's pretty much automatic already because it's the only way you, you, you've been trained how to think. Even by a university, uh, 
To go to a university is to get a PhD in dualistic thinking. Do you understand? <laughs> normally, normally. Yeah, it is. That's why religion distinguishes education from transformation. They're not the same thing. You can be educated and not transformed, and you can be uneducated and be profoundly transformed. Do you understand? <laughs> uh, you'd think we would have known that. You'd think we would have understood that. But we confuse it all. Just get them educated. Just send them to a Jesuit college. And then they're, you know. I have a Jesuit Cuban friend in Albuquerque, the pastor of the Jesuit parish. And he says, Yeah, we trained them in dualistic thinking, you know, in the best Jesuit university in Havana, and overnight lost all of it. You no, know? because they joined sides either totally against it or totally for it. But Christianity no longer fit in the equation because we hadn't taught them wisdom. We just made them good PhD Jesuit trained Catholics, you know. And when the real problems came, they, they had no deeper authority, as we talked about at Mass, to really know how to, how to address it or how to deal with it. So this is the pearl of great price. This is the change that changes everything. Uh, so you see how all of my themes really sort of come together in a way. I, I think they do. I hope they do. But one more thing I should mention, because I want you to see this in yourself, because uh, until you see it, you'll just argue with me. You understand? Oh, I don't know that I agree with him. Who's he? Now, uh, <laughs> everything becomes a question of authority. Does he have the authority to say this? Which is what they said to Jesus. By what authority do you talk this way? You know? So what a, a good authority does is put you back on your own experience and says, okay, you just observe yourself. Don't believe me. You just watch your mind for the rest of today. <laughs> this is early stage contemplation. And, <laughs> and watch how often you make judgments. You state preferences. I'm going to say it in different ways. It's so immediate, it's so automatic. I like this restaurant, not that restaurant, you know. We're set up for this. We have menus, you know, 55 things on the menu. I prefer this. And that's good, that's okay, but don't think it matters. Do you understand? <laughs> uh, you know, you're going to get fed and you're not going to die, but these things become ultimate importance for us. So, first of all, maybe what, why most great spiritual teachers said, do not judge. Here's probably what you would say. They're, they're really saying, do not label. It's the labeling tendency which the mind goes toward immediately. It's the base, why racism does not go away in low-level consciousness. And while, as I said at Mass, you're going to keep coming back until we transform people. You know, even liberals in the moment of stress fall right back into their lizard brain, you know. And they, <laughs> they are. It's true. And we got to say this. I've seen too many liberals relapse, you know. <laughs> and the racist comment comes out or the, or the homophobia or the, you know, sexism. It's all the same because they're labeling, don't you see? Until you deal with this, the usual liberal issues don't go to any depth. That's why I can't give up on religion. Because we are still qualified to talk about the true self and the false self and get to the foundation, clarify things at that level, and then most of the justice issues uh, fall in line. So not only do you distinguish immediately within the first nanosecond of what you like and what you don't like, but within the next five seconds... Uh, you start labeling why one side is better than another. You do. You do. You do. <laughs> we all do. Once you distinguish, I mean, Rene Girard would call it the scapegoat mechanism. For some reason, the damn mind, and I'm using damn intentionally now, you know, once it states its preference and distinguishes this from that, here from there, uh, you put one higher and one lower. You do. You do. Damn it. And, and until you catch yourself doing that, uh, d deep seeing, seeing with the eyes of God doesn't happen. Really doesn't happen. 
Now, because I knew most people wouldn't listen to me at that level because it sounds too mystical or something, I just talked about emotional sobriety. That you've got to rein in this emotional world which likes and dislikes far too much and then wraps around its likes and its dislikes and identifies with them. Uh, The medieval Franciscans would have said attaches to them. And once you attach, you're trapped. You're trapped. (laughs) So you've got to see yourself before the attachment even starts and see how deep the attachment is. Now, I hope that doesn't sound too sophisticated. It'll become second nature once it's second nature. And and you see yourself going down this this terrible path again of stating your preferences and deciding, you know, this kind of person is better than that kind of person. And then once you do that, you will find the evidence to prove it. And you will find, you'll feel absolutely logical because you found the evidence, you know. I'm sure this poor guy in Florida... He, you know, a victim of his racism or whatever, you know, he found the evidence that black boys going into white neighborhoods are always bad people. He probably thought he was being logical, probably thought he was protecting the neighborhood. As Thomas Aquinas says, no one intentionally does evil. His word was, you you always choose an apparent good. Inside of your little logic, inside of your little addictive system, in where you're not breathing underwater, you know, just surviving, uh, you explain this in your little mind. In his little mind, he thought he was, I guess, doing good for some people by shooting another person. <laughs> so that's how we can do evil and not call it evil. So this is no small issue this issue of addiction. Because what it becomes is what Jesus would call in the, in the New Testament blindness. Because you say, you see, you remain in your sin. This glib assurance that I see correctly or that my seeing is truthful. So I hope that gives you just a little taste of it. What I, what I tried to do was take each of the 12 steps and do a short chapter beginning with Uh, a good Old Testament Hebrew scripture quote, a good quote from the letters, and then a a quote from Jesus. Uh, So people wouldn't think I was selling out to psychology or selling out to to the alcoholics, you know, because that's what Christians want to think. Oh, this is lightweight, you know, this isn't scriptural. Well, it's amazing how scriptural it is. It was just easy to do. In fact, I finally, in each chapter, I had to say, okay, which is the best Hebrew scripture? Which is the best letter of Paul? Which is the best line from Jesus to make the point of step one, two, three, four, five? It was, it was always there. So, I don't know, should we take a few questions? Yes, or? Yeah, should. yeah, should okay, yeah, you're welcome. All right. yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm Joe, and I'm an addict. Uh, Hello, Joe. (laughs) uh, I was just wondering, um, like we talk about judgment, and I'm personally, I'm I'm Catholic. (coughs) Background. So I was just wondering if like there's some kind of judgment on Catholics, or, you know what I mean? Yes, let me talk. All right. (laughs) See, you can only get to non-dual consciousness when you first use basic dual consciousness. In other words, you have to be able to make value judgments about this is helpful, this is not helpful. This is real, this is unreal. We see Jesus do this. Jesus is a dualistic thinker too. He is, he is much more critical of Judaism than I ever am of Catholicism. I mean, he reams them out. <laughs> and this is his own religion. What Jesus did was bring to religion self-critical thinking, which he learned from the Jewish prophets. When any religion, Catholicism, Episcopalians, Methodists, Baptists, Mormons, when you don't have self-critical thinking, I'm going to make what is almost a blanket statement, religion is always 
idolatrous. It always worships itself, not God, you see. So I hope what I'm bringing, and forgive me if it didn't sound that way, is self-critical thinking to my religion. That's the only one I can criticize. I'm not free to criticize Methodists, you understand? But I'm, I'm still a Catholic priest in good standing, believe it or not. And <laughs> by the protection of the Franciscans. Uh, but <laughs> and um, so uh, I say, I offer my criticisms from the inside, not as an outsider. The way Jesus, I hope, criticized Judaism. But I hope I'm also making a point. That non-dual thinking is not naive false innocence. You've gone through the problems of seeing the dark side of of America, of Catholicism, whatever your group is, but then you've risen beyond it and can also still be a part of it, which is non-dual. So you have to be, in the end, both a dualistic, clear-headed thinker and move beyond it. That's the best of both worlds. Okay. Thank you. Richard, um, what I'm hearing from the journey you're talking about is that there's kind of this um, gaining of sol- false self and a death to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you say a word to the sh- about the folks in the world and our society who life is just uh, mm. lost mm. from the get-go? And what is their spiritual walk like? How it- Can you say something about that? I wish I'd spent more time on that in the book uh, Falling Upward the amount of people who, who aren't even allowed to do the task of the first half of life. They're beat up so much, abused, dismissed, denied, rejected, excluded, that um, if you... I, are you referring to falling upward or not? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, that they, they can't build the container. They have no container. I was jail chaplain for 14 years in Albuquerque, and that's, these were all young men and young women who were defeated before the get-go, you know? Abused by their dad or their mom or both or our life or the neighborhood. Uh, So I believe God, of course, gets to all of us. But God does have a much harder time, it seems, because they've somehow got to build some container of dignity. They've got to, to, as we would say, to feel good about themselves as a gay person, as a black person, as a rejected person, as a whatever person, that abused person that was told they weren't good. So, you know, the way you usually do that is by black and white thinking. Like, uh, here I was the priest at the jail, but the last thing sometimes I wanted to talk about was religion. And, because all these guys would get religion. And they, you know, they'd come, oh, Father, I found Jesus this week. And, there was a part of me that rejoiced, but a part of me that said, Oh, God, now we got our work. <laughs> because the Jesus that they found is sort of, you know, it's just a Jesus to, to now affirm my little world as perfect and right and okay and wonderful. And they're still usually hating of the outsider to their group now. Do you understand? It isn't high level consciousness, is what I'm saying. They often eventually get there if the heart space is open to. But if they just get religion in the head, this is half the fundamentalist churches in America. <laughs> they just like black and white answers. Give me total truth, you know, and don't make me think anymore. So there, the path of the person who was beat up early is first of all, and here's why you've got to be patient and work with them and affirm them and believe in them long enough so they can create what I call in falling upward a container. Uh, that I can feel good about myself enough to let go of myself, as Jesus said in the gospel. But you've got to let go of yourself, but you have to have a self to let go of a self. You therapists all know that. You've got to have an ego to let go of an ego. When your ego is taken away from you and beat up as a little boy or a little girl, your, your path is longer. And you need some wise teachers along the way. First, teachers who tell you to do the first half of life. Believe in yourself, boy. You're a good man. You're a son of God. And in that sense, the gospel is wonderful. You know, God's love is unconditional. You're forgiven. You're home free. 
And that's why they get so excited about Jesus, and they should. But as I said, the Jesus they've met is not usually the cosmic Christ yet. It's, you know, it's a little self-serving Jesus. So they need a second teacher. And usually life will offer them that through suffering to get them into bigger questions. Then, how am I wonderful? You understand? <laughs> how am I wonderful is just to get you started. Once you know you're wonderful, the real goal of it is, you know what? I've got an excess of energy, and I want to now tell other people that they're wonderful. That's the goal, to not just keep walking around, aren't I wonderful? (laughs) That's so big deal. See, the Jews made the same mistake. That's why the prophets came along. Aren't we? We're the chosen people. You know, and Isaiah and Paul both say, the meaning of your chosenness is so that you could have the experience to tell the rest of the world that they're chosen too. You follow me? And a small percentage of Judaism seemed to have gotten there. Catholicism absolutely imitated Judaism down to jot and tittle. Now, we became the only one true holy Catholic apostolic church and felt sorry for all you heretics, you know? <laughs> God just doesn't love you nearly so. <laughs> but, you know, many evangelical churches, fortunately the Episcopalians usually don't, uh, But many evangelical churches, they repeat what Judaism did, what Catholicism did, all over. Because that's what you do at early stage religion. It's all about you. You Next question. Uh, Yes, in in terms of making these immediate judgments, what element is related to fear, which goes back to the reptilian brain? Major. That's, that's really good you put your finger on it. Uh, the ego is fear-based at the core because its whole concern is not to change and not to die. When that's your obsession, 24 hours a day, not to cha- have to change and not to ever die, protect this little Richard thing as long as I can in its present form, uh, you are automatically fear-based and you made another good connection uh, it is what I call the lizard brain, yeah. And a certain good percentage of humanity, and it's not their fault, usually they were beat up, or weren't surrounded by wisdom figures in their youth, uh, are at the reptilian brain level. They don't know it's fear. as you know, They've lived with it so long, they think this is the way everybody is. Uh, you find that when you deal with fear-based people. They think all of us are walking around terrified each moment of what could go wrong, what could go wrong. When you look out at life from the fear glasses, it pretty much distorts all perception. You don't see truthfully. So what does the letter to John say? Perfect love casts out all fear. So the first half of life tends for all of us. And who of us don't love it in our teenage kids? You know, I mean, you can just see they're so scared of not succeeding, not looking good, not looking cool. And we can all remember being back there. They're, they're terrified going to high school every day. You know, until they can create a container which says, I'm good, I'm okay, I don't have to prove myself anymore. You're fear based. So, in a certain sense, first half of life is fear. The goal of religion, as Ken Wilber says, is to grease uh, consciousness so we can get more and more people into the second half of life. That we can live out of a love motivation instead of a fear motivation. And that's that's almost it in a word. That's that when you're operating out of love instead of fear, you're you're a second half of life person. You're mature. Okay. Okay. Uh, Richard, thank you for this wonderful presentation. I just have a short footnote to put to it. Having spent almost 30 years of my life in the Jesuit order, this is not a a, a food fight between Franciscans and Jesuits. I don't want this, but I don't think we can really dismiss Jesuit education or the Jesuit synthesis, the Ignatian synthesis, in quite the way you did. What the centerpiece of the Ignatian exercises is precisely what you were talking about. Experience. Discernment of the spirits yes. and everything underneath yeah. it. But the student in college didn't do the exercises. Well, maybe not. not. That's no. all right. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. Listen, the Jesuits have 
backed me up since my early Cincinnati days because they know I affirm what they're doing. But I'm talking about the intellectual game apart from the spiritual game. But Ignatius, as you well know, did both. You know, But to, to get a degree from a Jesuit university... The 30 days are not required, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last question, I think. Hi, I'm Meg, and I am an addict. I, um, thank you so much. And I, I'm looking at the chapter after the 12 steps, um, after the 12th step, and I want to read one paragraph. And okay. If, if everybody could just think God instead of where I, where I read love. You only know what love is by falling into it almost against your will because it is too scary and too big to be searched out, manufactured, or even imagined ahead of time. Love like God is a harsh and dreadful thing, according to Russian writer Dostoevsky. I wonder if that is why we both want it but also avoid a vital spiritual experience. And my my question is if you could comment on it also comes up in the awful grace of God um, that to me um, breathing underwater <coughs> and I hope you didn't already say this but to me breathing underwater is um, God is the ocean flooding over us and um, not because we want it to but because uh, because that's what God does mm -hmm. and in order to um, breathe underwater you have to have a vital spiritual experience I think you picked up something real central that, as in the poem, she uses the metaphor of the water, but it becomes the blood. It becomes a, 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 a two-sided symbol. It's both death and life. <laughs> it drowns you, but this drowning is what we would call the drowning of the false self or the addict, and so it ends up being the very thing you wanted. It doesn't look like it ahead of time. So uh, I, I think you're understanding it absolutely correctly that the, uh, the, the drowning, the dying, uh, the losing, which is, is uh, first experienced as a submersion or a loss of life, you see why we used it for baptism, you know, uh, is in fact the, the, the carry-through experience that transforms you. So you're hearing what I hope I'm saying very well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Richard Thank Moore. You.